Hey everyone, this is Pete, and welcome back to Atari ST A to Z, a series of short playthroughs of Atari ST games, some which I grew up with and some which are new to me. Today is one of the former. Today we're looking at Fast Food, which was a 1989 release from Codemasters, developed by the Oliver Twins. There were two slightly different versions of this game available. The ones for 8-bit platforms had very abstract visuals, whereas the 16-bit versions that we're going to be looking at today featured more realistic environments. The game was supposedly originally intended to be a promotional game for the Happy Eater chain of family restaurants that uh, were beloved of service station <laughs> attendees back in the day. Uh, but for one reason or another that fell through uh, partway through development and it was converted into what would become the third Dizzy game after the original Dizzy and Treasure Island Dizzy. So um, I used to really like this game back in the day so I'm looking forward to giving it another go today. So let's go play fast food. Okay, here we are with Fast Food by Codemasters, uh, now loading, so we get to admire the glory of the title screen. You can just about make out some detail on the uh, on the menu in the background. I used to really like this game. Uh, I had it as part of one of the Dizzy compilations that were available. Uh, we actually had some pre-release copies of, I think, two different Dizzy collections that there were for Atari ST. Uh, so I don't actually have any original box art for them, but I do have basically all the Dizzy games that came out on 16-bit computers. All right, let's begin. So choose a world. Let's start nice and easy. So this game is basically a sort of Dizzy-style take on sort of Pac-Man. If anything, it's closer to two Munchkin on the um, G7000 or the Odyssey 2. Uh, in that there's stuff moving around. And in a lot of cases, you end up having to sort of head off things so that you can catch them. Like the chickens run away from you. The hamburgers just sort of randomly wander around. Uh, but the chickens tend to sort of actively avoid you. So have to anticipate where they're going to end up. Now you see the second level has introduced uh, one of the baddies. I can't remember their names offhand. They have like some really bizarre names. Um, but yeah, they're basically uh, your common or garden Pac-Man style ghosts. And there are ways of dealing with them. If you get a shield icon, you can um, destroy them. I think one of the sauce bottles that appears also destroys them. It might be the red one. I forget. I'm sure we'll find out in short order. No pun intended. Right, so a couple of power-ups there. This one here, that makes you invincible. And this one makes you faster. This one here speeds up all the food. The green sauce... I don't know what that did. That might have slowed the food down without slowing Dizzy down. Okay, and then, a bit like classic Pac-Man, every so often you get a little cutscene and you get an extra life from it. Nice. So, extra life there. Now, yeah, like I said in the intro, there were uh, sort of technically two different versions of this. The 8-bit version had very abstract mazes, uh, whereas the 16-bit version was retooled so that all of the different worlds kind of had their own visual theme and looked distinct from one another. Yeah, there we are. So the red, red source destroys all the enemies for a moment. They'll come back, but it does give you a bit of breathing room. red British phone box there. Can you tell this game was made in the UK? Right, I've got a shield now so I can destroy the enemies by walking through them. I think you can only do that once. There's no actual sort of on-screen indication of how much you can do that so you just have to remember it I guess. Come here chicken. I always liked how the levels had different names on this. That reminded me very much of the actual Dizzy games where each individual room 
uh, had its own name. But obviously this is a very different kind of game to the main Disney adventures, which are arcade adventures, as they were referred to back in the day. Uh, so there were sort of arcade game style platforming elements, but then there was also inventory management and object manipulation and that sort of thing. Originally, I thought this came out much later. I thought this was quite a late era Disney game once he'd become sort of really well established and so on. But so I was quite surprised to learn that this was just the just the third Disney game after Dizzy and Treasure Island Dizzy. Um, but yeah, Dizzy was huge in the UK in the sort of late eighties, early nineties. Because they were they were solid games. They're really difficult games, and they're not to everyone's taste because because of that difficulty. Um, but they are important milestones in. Uh oh. Okay, so we don't want to get caught in the middle. <laughs> yeah, the Dizzy games are important milestones in computing and game development history. The Oliver Twins were hugely prolific. And like a significant proportion of um, software sales back in the day could be attributed directly to the Oliver Twins specifically. Just because the, the Dizzy games were so ubiquitous. They were everywhere. They were on every platform. And, crucially, they were cheap. That's the thing, it's easy to forget about Codemasters. Codemasters started as a direct-to-budget um, publisher. So, like, all their stuff originally would have been games that would come out on cassette on the Atari on the, not necessarily the Atari 8-bit, but the 8-bit computers in general. Um, and it would cost like maybe £2.99. And even their Atari ST releases, most of those were no more than a fiver to pick up. It's just, it's interesting to see how times change, because Codemasters now is one of the biggest sort of developer publishers in the world probably at least in terms of their specialist area which is um racing games so i mean if you're into racing games chances are you are very familiar with codemasters high score make your mark pete but no, Codemasters got its start making straight-to-budget releases for a variety of different platforms, including this one. All right, let's have another go. Let's try the second world. You get awarded an extra life straight away. <laughs> Oh yeah, I used to remember really liking the... I used to remember, I do remember really liking the music to this stage. In fact, the music in Dizzy Games generally is a good example of someone knowing how to make good use of the Atari ST sound chip. Um, the guy behind it was a guy called Alistair Brimble, who was one of those sort of fairly prolific composers in the 8 and 16-bit era. I, f I forget what else he did, but he... For me, I'll always primarily associate him with the Dizzy series. As I'm sure, I'm sure he did lots of other stuff as well. But I'll always fondly think on his work because he was someone who could make the ST sound chip really sing with some solid pieces of music. That you listen to something like this, and it, it doesn't sound like there's only three sound channels, does there? It, it sounds like that's a nicely rich piece of music with lots going on. And it's got a catchy tune, it's fun, it's very very sort of console style, is how I tended to think of it back in the day. It 
And that was another sort of cool repeal of the DZ games, really, as well, because... They were providing quite a console game-esque experience on computers at the time. Which was important in the UK, because... While we did have systems like the, the NES and the Super NES and the 2600 and so on... Um, home computers were a much bigger deal for a very long time. Probably sort of up into the... Whoops! Up until sort of the... Probably mid to late 16-bit era. The emphasis was very much on home computers, which is why series like Dizzy really thrived. Because they kind of provided a best of both worlds sort of thing. They gave you the sort of colourful, cheerful presentation that was associated with a lot of console games at the time, but they were on home computers. So those of us who didn't have an NES or didn't have a Super NES or a Mega Drive or whatever... We could still enjoy this sort of cheerful, cutesy experience without having to invest in any sort of additional hardware. You gotta love these levels being set in a supermarket. <laughs> I've always been a fan of kind of video games unfolding in real world environments. So like for example, I'm, I'm much more interested in say a first person shooter if you have the opportunity to, to go to somewhere a bit more relatable. It's another reason why I like a lot of uh, survival horror games as well is because they, they often take you through... Oops recognisable, relatable locales. Like schools and hospitals and apartment blocks, that sort of thing. So yeah, that's one reason I was quite fond of this game, because... Oh no, done it again. I, yeah, I just like the setting. I just like the fact that it's set in... Um, a realistic environment. And as I say, that is something that the 8-bit versions of this did not have. Not really due to technological limitations or anything like that, it was just put together by a different team. And the people behind the 16-bit version decided that they wanted to use some more believable environments. Oops. And it ended up making a pretty cool game as a result. Yeah, I've forgotten quite how much I, I love this piece of music. <laughs> Good old Alistair Brimble. He was a great composer. I vaguely remember seeing his name on something that I've played quite recently. And it was like the last place I expected to see his name. Because I always primarily associated him with... Um, with games from this era. I can't remember what it was offhand though. If I, if I remember I'll put it in the... Uh, I'll do a little, a little text flash. But uh, I will probably forget to do that. So I'm not promising anything. Anyway, let's have a go at the hard level. And then that will wrap us up for today. You notice that all these all these cutscenes are unique as well. It doesn't just repeat the same ones. I think there's there's a different one for every few levels. think this piece of music I think this is the same piece that is used in quick snacks which is a 
another Dizzy spin-off game that came a bit later that is often sort of mistakenly considered to be a sequel to this. Um, but while this is a sort of Pac-Man style affair, Quick Snacks is more of a take on Pengo. But yeah, I'm pretty sure this piece of music is like the main theme used in Quick Snacks. Oh god, yes, this is this is hard. <laughs> well, that went well, didn't it? Fifty points. Let's let's try that again. Can we go into the last one? No, we can't. So you've actually got to get through the hard level before you can open the last one. And you can skip the cutscenes. Oh, I do not like the dead ends that they add. What does this green one do? Oh, it slows down all the enemies. Then we can blow them all up. Lovely. Listen to that tune. Top notch Alistair Brimble nonsense. Love it. Oh god, yeah, I remember this level. This was really weird to see in a sort of Pac-Man style game because you normally don't have wide open spaces like that and so you don't normally have diagonal movement but yeah that was actually genuinely quite a real wow moment <laughs> when people first played that I find these games endlessly interesting because when you say to someone these days, oh it's a it was a budget release, it was straight to budget. There's often sort of the assumption that that means it's not gonna be very good or very worthwhile or very creative. It's just gonna be a cheap cash in to try and jump in on a trend, but For a significant part of gaming history, for a significant part of gaming history, the budget sector has been where the most creativity has been. And that was very much true in this era. And it pretty much continues to be true to this day when you think about it, because if you... We don't necessarily have a budget sector that as it existed back in the day but our closest equipment these days is the indie sector which releases games at a low price point highly creative games very often and takes risks that big developers and publishers wouldn't dream of doing so yeah that's, that's basically still true today it was certainly true throughout the uh, the PlayStation era as we have stuff like the Simple series. And the Sega Ages games. Oh no! Oof. But yeah, stuff like this is a, just a, a great example of where a lot of the creativity in the game sector of the late 80s early 90s was it was not in the big name games it was not in the licensed games the arcade conversions the movie licenses all that sort of thing it was in these small scale games that you could get for your pocket money and that's cool Incidentally, if you're curious about um, Dizzy and some of the Oliver Twins other games, if you have an Evercade, they have just released the Oliver Twins collection cartridge for that, which contains a selection of Dizzy games. Don't think this is on there. 
but it's it, it's got the basically the the NES versions of a lot of classic Dizzy games, along with some that only came out for consoles. Uh, and so, if you want to learn a little bit more about this intriguing part of gaming history, then yeah, pick up that cartridge. And of course, um, I'll be covering those games on the Evercade A to Z series uh, on Fridays as well. So do watch out for those episodes when they come along. For now, though, I think it's time to set fast food aside for the minute. I have enjoyed that, though. I am uh, I'm glad that holds up because I used to really like this game back in the day and I'm glad it, it it's still fun. It's still a genuinely enjoyable game. So, yeah, glad to see that. As always, thank you very much for watching and I'll see you again next time.